Good day and welcome to class time, your daily classroom for CSEC students. In today's lesson, we'll be giving you some exam tips on consumer arithmetic and set theory. I am Nikisha Bailey. And I am Nikisha Hardy. Okay, so as I said before, we're, we're going to be looking at consumer arithmetic and sets. So the focus for today's lesson is answering multiple choice questions on consumer arithmetic and sets. Okay, so now for some exam tips when we're answering multiple choice questions. So our first tip, read the entire question carefully. Okay, then reread the question and focus on what the question is asking. That's very important. Then we want you to highlight all relevant information needed to answer the question so you can underline, circle, whatever it is. Okay. Also, eliminate wrong answers. That will help to save time. And we'll see how that works later on. Yes. Decide on your plan. So how are you going to answer the question? Yes. And then apply your strategy after you have made that decision. Right. Important thing, check your work. Check, check, check. All right, and ensure to indicate your answer because sometimes we work the question, get our answer, we forget to indicate on our answer sheet right. our answer. And multiple choice, we don't leave anything blank. We no. shade all the answers. Definitely. All right, so these are the breakdown of the topics that we hope to cover during this session. So for consumer arithmetic, we have quite a number of things. So we are thinking of profit and loss, mm -hmm. higher purchase, discount and sales tax, interest, simple and compound, currency conversion, utility bills, depreciation, wages, overtime. And just to name a few. Now under sets, we're hoping to look at intersection, union, subset, Venn diagram, complement of a set, set notation, cardinality of sets as well. So let's get into it, okay. starting with consumer arithmetic. And our first question. So a dress which costs $180 is sold at a discount of 10%. The amount of the discount is? So you have read the question. Let's find out what the question is asking us applying those tips that we have mentioned earlier. We also need to highlight the important words in the question. So we see discount. What is discount? All right, so when we think of discount, we're thinking about we're paying less for our goods, right? Right, because right. sometimes we go into stores and we see 10% discount to 15% um, discount when they're having a sale or just um, Or sometimes they give you and they say like $1,000 off, or still $1, discount. Yes, it's so a discount reduction. can be given in terms of the percentage or the monetary amount. Right, so it's a reduction. So it means therefore that um, my answer, because they're asking amount, the amount of the discount, they are not asking the amount that you will pay for the after dress after discount. you have applied the discount. All right. So we're looking at the figures 180 mm -hmm. and 10. 10. So can we eliminate any of these answers? All right. So based on percentage, we see that 10% would be one tenth of 180. So we know based on what we know that 100. Uh, Seventy dollars. That one is not, out. Would have to eliminate, eliminate that one because it's just ten percent, right? It's just ten percent of it. All right. So let's see how we would do our calculation. One. Uh, so we're looking at ten percent of one hundred eighty dollars, and as we said before, that is one tenth of one hundred eighty. And there we have it. So based on our calculations, the discount is going to be $18. So our answer here would be C. Okay, makes sense. So that means $18 will be coming out of that $180. So the second question, a dinner at a restaurant was advertised at $60 plus 
18% tax. The total bill for this dinner was. So here we are looking at the cost of the dinner and we're seeing plus, which indicates addition or an increase in the price. All right. And also total, so we're looking also at addition again. Right. All right, so usually stores, um, when we purchase items, generally, we pay consumption tax, or we know GCT. GCT. Right. In our country, it is 16.5% currently. That's for the government. Yes. It is still 16.5, or is it 15? I think it's 15. It I, think, well, I think it was reduced. Oh, that's good. <laughs> All right, so at this restaurant, the tax is 18%. So again, um, plus, remember, we're talking about plus. So it means our answer, looking at our answer, options it couldn't be a because it would be more than sixty dollars right so we'd have eliminated a as an option what so we have three options remaining three options remaining to choose okay from. so let's see which of these would be the correct option to choose all right so here we have our solution so we have two methods for you so method one we are basically finding 18 percent of the price that we're given and then we're going to add what this increase amount is going to be. So we're going to be adding $60 to the amount that we calculate here. So the tax would be added to the cost of right. the dinner. So 18% of $60 would give us $10.80. So this is the tax that we're going to be adding to our original cost price. For the dinner. And that would give us the total bill for the dinner of $70.80. Now we said there are two methods. So you, the $60, notice we have 118%. Usually percentage is out of 100. So right. the 100% would be the cost of the dinner, which is 60. However, we're adding another 18% to that. So we can add, as you can see, 18 to 100. So now we're calculating 118% of $60. And that gives you the answer right away. Right away, because you have already included the percentage. Right. So clearly, our answer is going to be B. Awesome. Now, we are going to buy a, a refrigerator, and the refrigerator cost $1,850. Now, the buyer who is given a discount, here we are looking at discount again, of 5% for a cash price. Now, we mentioned discount before. And in the previous question, we were looking at the discount amount. Right. This time, we want to know how much the person will be paying for the refrigerator after, after discount which is a reduction in the price. All right. So looking at our answers, B is less than, which is good. Um, a is more than, so if it is so a clearly. discount, we can eliminate A. Right. All right. And this is a 5% discount, so I'm thinking that D is too far off. Right. Yes, 5% of that D would be too far off. So we can eliminate A and D. So we already have the working on screen. Hope you weren't cheating. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our response here, the correct answer would be C. All right, let's look at... All right, so we're moving on to question four. So the annual interest rate on a mortgage on a house assessed at a value of $450,000 is five cents on every $1. What is the interest paid on the mortgage for the first year? And what pops out here to me, this interest rate and mortgage. Okay. Also in the question, it gives us the information of five cents on every dollar, okay? And you know that some persons, they tend to get the cents mixed up. How do you write five cents? Also the 50 cents and the five cents, how do you actually represent it? So here we have a presentation for you on the screen. So five cents Which is, is five out of a hundred cents. Right. Because 100 cents make one dollar. Right. And so, also, how many one dollars are in four hundred fifty thousand? What? It's a giveaway. All right. <laughs> the same amount four hundred fifty thousand. All right. All right. So that is saying that 
on every one dollar five cents is paid as um, interest for the mortgage so notice we are calculating the five cents of the value of the mortgage which would give us twenty two thousand five hundred so the option there would be B. B. Yes. All right. So question five. So here we're looking at this question where we're talking about simple interest. So it says the simple interest earned on $600 invested at 5% per annum for three years is given by. So we're looking at $600, which we have three figures in here, $600, which would represent the principal. The principal are the money invested. Right. And the 5% per annum would be our rate. And the three years would be our time given. Our time given. All right. So normally when we're working simple interest, there's this formula that people normally use. They're mm -hmm. multiplying the principal times the time times the, the rate. rate. All right. And the rate is out given of 100. In percentage, percentage. So it's out of 100. All right. So using this formula that it's principal times time times the rate, we would expect to get... $600 times three, and three here would be three years, yes. times five out of 100. Right. But we should note that the 100 here is coming from the percentage linked to the, the five. Rate. Yes. And if we should look over there. So while we're not seeing a response that looks dead on, spot on to what we have here, yes. we can see that option D yes. is actually the same. And we can say that this is as a result of the commutative property of, of multiplication. multiplication. Yes. All right. So our answer here is D. D. So now question six. Go ahead, Nikisha. All right. So at the end of the year, a car is worth 5% less than what it was worth at the beginning of the year. So if a car is worth 9,500 in December 2016, that's the end of the year, then its value in January 2016, same year, was... So we're looking at depreciation, right? Yes, because with cars, with motor vehicles, they lose value annually. Right. They do not cost the same at the end of the year. Value decrease. Okay. So you, in this situation, the value of the car is 5% less than it was at the beginning of the year. So we need to point out also that the cost that we're given, the amount that we're given here is the amount at the end of the year. So if we want to find the amount at the beginning of the year, we know it's going to be more, more than, than $9,500. Awesome. So, so A, A would, would automatically be out. out. Yes. Why is it automatically out? Because it is less than 9,500. And it, based on what we're told, and we're looking at January, that's what we want to know. It should be more than 9,500. It seemed like buck up because so far all the A's that we would have gone through, those are the ones that we're eliminating. <laughs> not, not to take that as a general right. thing, please. As I'm saying, it's a buck up. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore means we first have to find 5% of, oh, we're using the proportion method first. So here we have 95%, and this 95% would be the value, which is 5% um, so less the end of the year. than 95%. So the 100% would be at the beginning, beginning of, of the year. year. Right, and doing cross multiplication here, or inverse operation, making X a subject would be dividing by 95. So our response would be $10,000. So at the beginning of the year. Yes, 9,500 at the end, 10,000 at the beginning. That makes sense. And you know, if students have a knowledge of what 10% is like. Yes. So they could actually start from the, from the answers. Yes. So they could look at the answer. Well, I don't know, for me, this one looks like a nice number to me, the 10,000. So mm -hmm. I'll say, all right. So 10% of 10,000 is 1,000. Yes. So 5% is half of that, which is 500. 500. So if I take off 500. Makes sense. So you can make some intelligent guesses and actually yes. check and see if your guess is correct. Yes. 
and because remember multiple choice questions are time sensitive so we right. have to ensure that we use our time wisely all right question seven all right, so a computer is sold on higher purchase, and the higher purchase price consists of a deposit of $850 and eight monthly payments of $70 each. How much does a customer pay for the computer? So this is another concept, higher purchase. This is another method of purchasing items if you don't have the cash, all the cash to pay for it. So the company offers you this payment option where you make a deposit and then make monthly installments of equal amount and usually you end up paying more than yes. the cash price or the so mark price. So it's convenient because you don't have all the money at yes. once, but at the end of it, you're going to end up paying more than the well, original cost. you have to pay cost. tomorrow. You have to pay tomorrow. Right. So let's see how much a customer would pay. So they have their deposit. Right, so we have our deposit plus $870, all right? And $870 is going to give us $560. $560. So we know that um, option A wouldn't be an, or an option, an answer, neither because we'll be paying more than um, 850 and eight and five is way more than that. All right, so our option here is option D. Mm -hmm. 1,410. Question eight. Someone's regular pay is $3 per hour up to 40 hours. Now, overtime is twice the payment for regular time. If he was paid $216, how many hours of overtime did he work? Okay. Now, sometimes, as you can see, um, income is paid on different, different agreement. You have hourly paid or monthly payment or fortnightly payment. Now, in this situation, this person is being paid per hour. And a regular working hour is 40 hours per week. And for each of those 40 hours, it's $3. Per hour. Right. right. So now, overtime is the extra hours. Any hour of more than 40. And to be honest, since Corona, I feel like I'm doing a whole heap of overtime. You know? <laughs> I understand. Me too. <laughs> so overtime is hours extra more than the 40 hours and no, usually this is where you make more money because over time the, this in this situation you're being paid twice the payment of the regular, the regular rate time. so or sometimes you can be paid one and a half it depends on the company All right so twice the payment would be two times three dollars Right? So we know that for every hour after 40 hours, we'd be getting $6 per hour. Okay, that is right. All right. So the thing about this question is we're told what the overall pay is after. When Everything. You when you include that overtime. Yes. So we want to find out how many hours of overtime All right. the person worked. So here's our solution. So for, let's first calculate because we know that he worked $216 for the work hours that he did. For 40 hours is $3 multiplied by 40. Now this would give us this regular pay. So which is $120. So out of this $216, first part, the 40 hours is 120. So the rest would be for overtime. overtime. And remember this overtime is calculated at $6 per hour. So we know that the overtime pay is $96. So to find out the number of hours, we are dividing $96 by Six, $6. Right. And we will take, notice that we said we subtract total pay, take regular pay to give us the m amount of money that was worked for overtime hours. And as we said, we got $96. All right. So, so after we would have completed our calculations, mm -hmm. our response is going to be... Yes. It's going to be B. $16. Right. All right. Question nine. Nikisha, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Nikisha. So a man's taxable income is $35,200. He pays tax at a rate of 25%. The amount of income tax he pays is. So we want to find out how much is 25% of 
that taxable income, 35200 that this gentleman will be paying out and of his income. And this income tax thing now is something that... We oh. all have to pay as long yes. as we're working. One, one of those deductions <laughs> that we yes. don't really like to see, but it has to be taken out, right? Yes. And some things we can look at, 25%. 25% is one quarter. Right. Same as one quarter. So it would mean that we would be dividing 35,200 by? By four. By four. So we can therefore look to eliminate answers uh, when we quickly can see that 3,500 divided by four, that would not be A. So again, we can eliminate A because if we work it backwards, though, we multiply by four. Mm -hmm. 8,000 by, by four, four. divide by 32,000. So A yeah. again cannot work. Ah, see what you mean when you say working backwards. You All right. multiply the answer so by four. So if I skip out B, no, can be kind of look sensible. Mm -hmm. Let's look at C. 9,000. Let's look at the 9,000. Multiplying that by four. Would 36. Be, that's would be more. more than. So that one is out. Out. And this one is clearly way out. So my guess based on what we just did is that the answer is going to be B. B. And we can always check. Let's check. All right. So let's find 25% of 35,200. So my can answer we have was it? correct. 8,000. $800. Awesome. So that was quick checking based on what we know about percentage, right. fractions, and decimal. All right. So this one is on currency conversion. Mm -hmm. So if $6.40 in Trinidad and Tobago is equivalent to one US dollar, yes. then if I have 16 TNT dollars, how much is this going to be in US dollars? Talk to me, because I want some US dollars. All right, so I'm going to be looking, I want some too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be looking at this question now. So we're, we're comparing TNT and US, US dollars. Awesome. So we're given the rate. So $6.40 equivalent to one, to US. one dollar mm -hmm. in the US. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm looking at something. If I wanted two US dollars, yes. I would be doubling this Six amount. Six dollars forty, yes. So again, I'm going to kind of ignore the the forty cents a bit just oh. to have an idea of what the number is going to be like. Yes. So if I double six dollars, I'm expecting to get twelve dollars. Yes. So still need some more, not true. Still need some more. All right. If I triple six dollars, three six is eighteen. It's going to be more than. It's going to be more. Mm -hmm. All right. So can we now use this to eliminate some so of these responses? So it's between two and three. Between two and three. So between so two again, and three dollars. And again, students, this is for book up. This is book up that is always eliminated. All right. Yes. <laughs> it's only book up. <laughs> all right. So we're looking for an answer that is between two and three dollars. All right. So A is out. Yes. C's out? Yes. B's out? Yes. So let's prove it. Let's check and see if it actually works. Awesome. And remember, we're doing this because remember, multiple choice questions are time sensitive. Right. Mm -hmm. So based on our calculations, and again, we're using the proportion method here, yes. we find that X is actually $2 and 50 cents. So for my $16 at TT dollars, I will get Two dollars and fifty US dollar dollars, right? Yes. Okay. And boy, the US dollars, oh Lord, it's Strong. soaring. Oh, gone, it gone. <laughs> All right. So let's move to question eleven. All right. This one, no. Many students are gonna say, "Why? Letters, letters, yeah, no algebra. numbers." <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So this one is consumer arithmetic, but we're using some variables here. Yes, yes. So if P peaches cost C cents, then the cost of one peach is. And to get you a little bit more comfortable, mm -hmm. let's use some numbers. All right. So. Um, we're, sometimes you go to the market, right? You go to the market and you need to buy stuff. So for example, you're going to buy three pounds of yam and the person says to you, it is uh, six, say three, 300, no, not $300, say $80 a pound for the yam. 
So you want three pounds. So it would be three times $80 or three $80. That would give you the total cost for the three pounds of yam. All right. Because you already know the unit cost, which was $80. And um, the quantity, the would, quantity would be three, so pounds. three pounds. Right. So we can find the total, the cost price for the three pounds. But sometimes you might go and you pick up an item. Say, for example, in the supermarket, sometimes it just gives you the total price for the total right. weight. So you don't know how much it, the unit per pound. So you are seeing that $240 for this package. But how much is, does it cost for one pound in the package? And you know, if you look, if you actually look closely at the packaging, you will see the unit price on it. But how many persons actually observe the things that they are buying? And suppose it's not in the supermarket. Suppose it's in the market. You go, and the person just give you a price. Right, they already have the things packaged. I say, all right, this is for yes. So you want to know the unit cost to and see. And you can if always it... use these things to help you to make your decisions when you're buying. You know. Yes, definitely. So math counts in every situation. All right, so if we use those figures that we discussed earlier, mm -hmm. so it was the... $80 per pound. And three pounds, we got $240. Yes. So if we put some of these figures in our question here, so let's say that if three mm -hmm. peaches cost $240, $240, then the cost of one peach is... I need now to divide the total cost right. by the amount of peaches that I just bought. That is right. So that would be 240 divided by three peaches. Which would give us $80. $80. $80. So what we just did is to help you to understand this a little bit better. So Nikisha mentioned that we are actually dividing. Yes. So if we use a concept of dividing, so our imaginary question was if... Three, Three peaches, peaches cost $240. Cents. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. So what we said, we would have divided. Yes. So if we're dividing whatever number would have been here mm -hmm. by this one. Yes. So it means that if we look at our actual question, then it's going to be whatever is C here, which is C divided, divided by, by P. P. Makes sense. And yes. since we want the cost, we yes. can leave off the units, which would be cents. cents. Awesome. So our answer here is going to be? And as we had discussed before, the number of items multiplied by the unit cost of the item will give us the cost for the total items. However, if you want to find the unit cost for the item, it means you'd have to divide the total cost by the number of items. Right. So our answer here is B. B for Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so question 12. An insurance company charges the following annual rate per $1,000 for property insurance. Mm -hmm. And here's a quotation. So for comprehensive insurance, it is $2.25. Now, what is the annual premium payable for insuring a house valued at $250,000? under the comprehensive scheme. So you have read that question and it seemed a little bit wordy. Right. Just read it again, reread it, and pick out the most, the key points, the key words. And sometimes we can just put our own little understanding to it, you know, Definitely. to read the English. You can go part to yes. what, what do you, what you understand from yes. this, not true? Right, so this is saying annual rate per, and I know per mean each, or for everyone, one. Um, so for every $1,000 for property insurance, the comprehensive insurance is $2.25. And they're asking us for the value of insuring a house valued at $250,000 under this scheme. So here what? The yes. house value $250,000. And they say I must pay $1,000. I must pay two dollars twenty five cents for every thousand dollars. So the question: How much thousand dollar give me that the amount? How oh, many thousand dollars are two in two hundred fifty thousand? And it is telling you two hundred fifty. So I guess the working is going to be pretty simple. Yes. Well, at least we know what the calculation is going to be. Yes. So it's going to be the two hundred fifty times, times the rate per thousand. All right. 
right? So 250,000, 250, sorry, because there are 250, Thousand in two hundred fifty thousand, and each of them is um, paid at a rate of two dollars twenty five cent. Multiplying that will give us five hundred sixty two dollars fifty. All right, so Nikisha, before we move on, is there a quicker way for students to actually do this calculation? Uh, dividing by, you mean so that last part two hundred fifty times two dollars twenty five cents. Remember, they can't use the calculators in the exam. Is that a quicker mm -hmm. way to do it? Mm -hmm. We can look two times, it's two, two times, times for, um, 250, which would be 500. But and we know that we have 20, the cents, And since we have the cents, it's going to be a little bit more. Yeah, than. but we know that 25 is a quarter. Right. So it's a quarter of the 100. And so. if you look at the options, mm -hmm. so while uh, the digits okay. are similar, but the places are different, the so, values are totally different. Right. So using what you said, 250 times two, yes. then I'm expecting 500, something, something more, more than, a little a bit more, more than, than 500. 500. Yes. So A again is out, book up. B seems to be good. C, that's way out. Yes. And D is also way out. Right. So clearly the most suitable response here would be B. Awesome. All right, so this should I think, take care of consumer arithmetic. Yes, we have covered quite a number of concepts yes. on the consumer arithmetic. And it just needs for you to practice in order for you to be efficient and proficient in applying the different skills and tips that we have mentioned right. earlier. So now we're going to move into looking at some sets questions. So our first question on the sets, we have if you, the universal set, consists of elements one, two, three, and the little dots in there mean four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and S, the set S is four contain elements four, five, six, seven, eight, then S complement with the little mark at the top of S complement, meaning that it's not a member of set S. So it's not in S, but it should be a part of the universal, universal set. set. Because the universal set contains set S. Okay. Because these numbers, four, five, six, seven, eight, are a part of the universal set. So basically, what I'm doing, I'm gonna be looking at set S. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking firstly at my universal set, so the entire thing. So I know numbers I'm looking one at to ten. counting numbers. Right. From one to ten. to 10. And I'm looking at set S, which has four, five, six, seven, eight. So if I want the complement of set S, I'm looking at all the elements that are the not, counting numbers yes. from one to ten. They're not, they're not in a set They S. are not four, five, six, seven, so eight. So if I look at it now, what's missing from here that is in the universal set? One is missing, two is missing, three is missing, nine is missing, and ten is missing. So there we have it. We have our answer. So again, A is out. Mm -hmm. B is out. Yes, B is out because it didn't include it doesn't include nine and ten. And the thing is, before we go any further, for A, while nine and ten is not included in S, yes. this set is incomplete because yes. we have more elements that were not included. Right. The same thing for B. Mm -hmm. C almost there but is not complete as well. There's something else missing. Right. But if we look at D. D has the answer, the set that contains all the missing elements from set S. From set S. And that's so what complement is. D is the complement of set S. So yes. we have one, two, three, nine, and ten. Awesome. So here we have an explanation for you. All right. So in this question, we have a Venn diagram, and we're being asked to identify what the shaded portion represents. All right, so in the universal set, we have set P, two sets, sets P and Q. And we notice that there's both of them overlap. This overlap suggests what? That there are elements 
that are common to both set P and set Q. In other words, they are sharing some elements. Right. Awesome. So if we were to, so this one is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm because students would have been familiar with this, yes. knowing that this is the intersection. But if we look at our options, so they know it means intersection, but do they know the symbols? Okay. All right, so the options. So this first one, what is the symbol? That in the middle between P and Q would be our union symbol. And the union symbol suggests everything, both of them. All the elements in both sets coming P together Q. to make one. All right, what about option B? We have their P intersect Q complement. So we just did S complement. We talk about complement previously, right. which are not in. So it, we're, they are be, we're being asked in B here for the elements in P that intersect or are common in the complement or those elements that are not in Q. All right. So. And C is showing those elements that are not in P intersecting those elements with the elements in Q. And the final one is P intersect Q. Intersect you know, there's something about this question. I'm looking at this question, and I'm seeing that three of the options have the same symbol. So right away, right. I'm not even going to look at this first one. I don't know if it... <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm seeing three of the same thing here. So I'm going to say, all right, one of these must be the must be the answer. Yes, yes. So D would be your answer. P All intersect right. Q. Okay. So in, in the figure, you can see the figure there in the center, the universal set Which has the, the elements mm -hmm. A to H. So we could describe it as saying the universal set contains the first eight letters of the alphabet. Yes. All right, so how do I read that part? So we are being asked to list the elements that are in Y, X intersect Y, and we just talk about intersection, the elements that they share that are common right. to both sets, and we want to unionize or join them with the elements in set Z. All right, so we have three subsets of the universal set. All right, and we notice that in Set X, we have B, C, E, F. Set Y, we have C, D, F, G. And in set Z, we have E, F, G, H. So we were to look at this question in part. Mm -hmm. So X intersect Y would be all the elements that are common to both X set X and y. set Y. So if we look at our diagram, we would see that this portion where C is would be that element would be the intersection for X and Y. And we need to also include the F, F. because F is also in that overlap. Awesome. So there we have it. So that section contains the element C and F. F. Now, the elements in set Z, as we mentioned, would be E, F, G, and H. So if we put all these elements together, and we're putting them together because, because it says union, union. Mm -hmm. then our option is going to be A. So A is finally an answer. And notice that F is so in Nikisha. both. <laughs> now, before we move to the next question, I'd like to point out um, an important point. Notice that in set X intersect Y, we have element F, and it is also in um, the set Z as well. But however, in our answer, notice F is not written twice. All right, we do not write the element twice. We don't have to repeat the element. And that's important to note. That's very important. Okay, so now on to question four. So if set A contains the elements three, six, nine, then the number of subsets of A would be? And when we talk about subsets, we're talking about sets that are a part of or coming from a larger set. So, Nikisha, what sets can we get from this given set, set A? All right, so currently set A consists of three elements, and we want to know how many other subsets, smaller sets, we can get from set A. All right. So, I could put um, three in a set. So? 
three only. Yes. I could also put six only. Six only. Or I could also put nine only. So that's three so far. So I've made up sets of so one. All right. One. Option A, automatically out. Okay. <laughs> Um, but what if I just do that and I just look at B and I choose B? But the elements, the sets that you just gave me, they only contained one element. What if I wanted a set with two elements? Okay, so I could there, so that means B would be all two. So I would therefore right. join, I could join three and six together to make a set. I could also do six and nine to or make a set. Three or three and nine. Or three and nine. So, so, so far we have how many? Six. Six. Yes. But what if I wanted a set containing three? Can the set be and its own subset? Yes. Yes. Yes, it can be. But and what also, if the set doesn't contain any elements? Can that be a subset? That can also be a subset, which would be an empty set. Okay. Right. So there we have it. If we, we should always remember mm -hmm. that a subset of a given set, we can always have, and we, sh we will always have the empty set yes. and the set, the set itself. itself. As a part of the number of sets that can be derived from the sets. So clearly the option here is going to be option D because we had six originally yeah. and we included those the two The empty at set the end. and the set itself. Awesome. Or another conventional way, the number of sets is usually represented by two raised to the n power. And that N represents the number of elements. of elements in the set. But if you told me that long time, I would just go one, two, three, and then two raised to the third, the third power. power. And two to the third power is actually two multiplied by two multiplied by two, which gives us the? the yes. N. Two multi, right. So two raised to the power of three is not two times three. We are saying two raised to the power of three is multiplying two three times. Okay. So we're getting there. Right. So the answer is eight. D. Right. So that would be the number of sets that can come, number of subsets that can come from the given thing. set. Awesome. All right. So question five, which of the following sets is equivalent to the set containing A, B, C, and D? All right. Now I'm seeing something here. Equivalent. What do we mean by equivalent? Meaning that they have the same number of elements the same elements but they don't have to be this they, they don't have the same number of elements but they don't have to actually look the same okay yes so i know that students they normally hear equivalent and, and they normally equal. hear equal. equal so what's the difference so, yes yeah, so i can't use equal and equivalent interchangeably well there are times when you have how is it again so there are times when you have Equal, equal sets being equivalent, but not equivalent being equal. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if equivalent now means that they have the same number yes. of elements, then clearly. And I'm seeing there are one, two, three, four elements. So this does not, this, so this four does not mean. No, that means that that set has one element. So the element here is four. So yes. don't, don't confuse the four, the number of elements there with option A, which right. says that four is an element in this set. So clearly our answer is going to be C. I notice C, the, as I said before, equivalent, they have the same number of, but they don't have to look the same. In this set, we have A, B, C, D. However, in set C, there are P, Q, R, and S. All right. So let's move on quickly to question six. Okay. So we have three sets here. So P, prime numbers, mm -hmm. Q, odd numbers, and R, even numbers. Now, which of the following sets is empty? And these are our options. All right. So let's look at it. So prime numbers and odd numbers. Do we have anything, All right. any relation, any link between these two types of numbers? Yeah, so prime numbers are numbers that are divisible only by one and itself. And the odd numbers would be numbers that are not divisible by two without leaving a remainder. But well, we have to remember that two is a prime number. Oh, yes. So we can say that most mm -hmm. of the prime numbers are odd with the exception of two. two. Awesome. So yes. if we link it with the even numbers, we can say that there's only one even number that is prime. And 
odd numbers cannot be divided by two without So they are not even? No. All right. So based on our discussion, which of these options would work? To be empty. So we just mentioned all of these. Right. So therefore, odd numbers cannot be even, and most prime numbers are odd numbers. Mm -hmm. And the only prime number that is even is two. two. So the option here that fits would be option D. D, which says that right. Q intersect R. R. All right, we have to move a little faster. So that would be empty. Mm -hmm. Question seven. Which of the following sets is defined by... Now, Nikisha, help me with this one. How do I read this one? So this is saying X is a member of the set of integers. So that Z, that funny looking Z means set of integers. Okay. Right. Um, notice, and it is saying that this, the, the X is greater than negative 3, but less than or equal to negative 2. So... Greater than negative three, we're yeah. looking at negative two up, right? So it's not negative four as some no, persons no. might think. So it's, we're looking for uh, values that are greater so than negative three. So we want to start in that, that negative two, and we should go up to positive two because it is less than or equal to two, which means positive two is included. And based on what I'm seeing there, C would be our option. Okay. Okay. And our last question, based on what we have time for. So what does the shaded portion of this Venn diagram represent? So Nikisha P is the only thing I'm not seeing shaded. Right. And based on what we, uh, we spoke we discussed about earlier, complement. So anything that is not in P, it would be P, P complement. So our answer here is going to be a. Finally, one answer is A. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right.